Dr. Thomas Stocker, our guest, he is co-chair of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, he works out of Switzerland, but you have taught in many different places, uh, Columbia, McGill, all Hawaii of that. Hawaii even. Hawaii, Hawaii even? Yes. That's I a good on gig. sabbatical in you Hawaii. You see, that's very smart. <laughs> Although Switzerland is extremely beautiful. That's right. Mm -hmm. So nuclear power, option, not option, nuclear energy. For a long time, uh, many people were of the understanding that nuclear energy is there to buy us some time to develop the next generation mm -hmm. of uh, technology, of energy technology that would harvest uh, wind, sun at grand scale. Now, the recent developments have shown that even under uh, strict regulations and so forth, this is a risky business, and therefore countries have now mm -hmm. moved forward to phase out that technology. Well, post-Japan, you see uh, Germany, France, you say Switzerland. That's right. Uh, it's an additional challenge, of course, to meet the climate targets, but on the other hand, we can say it's now a clear signal to all stakeholders there is no other option than sustainable development regarding energy sources. Okay, so as the world runs out of cheap oil, and I assume we are, and we look at projects in Alberta like the oil sands, uh, good idea, not a good idea, what are the pros and cons? I think uh, the not so cheap oil, you mentioned uh, the oil shales, uh, but there's also Arctic drilling. They all uh, go into ecosystems uh, whose functions we depend on. Uh, I don't think the technology is there to contain spills, to contain the technology that uh, is used to extract at a very high energy cost that uh, right. uh, oil that is uh, mm -hmm. and that uh, carbon that is uh, stored in there. And if not that, uh, we look at offshore drilling. We certainly saw what happened in the Gulf and other places. So if, if we don't get our energy source from there, from fossil fuels, what are some good options, some clean options, cleaner options, greener options? Well, first of all, we have to say that we should perhaps move away from the notion of a centralized uh, energy policy where everything is coming from one power plant or from one source. We need to think decentralized. Uh, there are now technologies in place where your own home can be an energy producer mm. in the course of one year while at the same time delivering energy for your own household. Why don't we go into that mm -hmm. direction? We it's should do that direction. It's always puzzling. If the science is there, the technology is there, and we could uh, you know, have more solar panels and, and reuse water and uh, somehow tap the geothermal. <laughs> These would all be very good options. Uh, only that the oil has been so cheap in the past mm -hmm. that the motivation wasn't really high to go right. this extra mile to develop and harvest these technologies. Mm -hmm. As you look at other aspects like aerosol cans, I know that sounds like a little minor thing, but in the old days when we used to whip a lot of hairspray out of the aerosol cans, they changed that. This is the one success story of humanity when it comes to recognizing a global problem, the CFCs that were mm -hmm. coming out of these cans and uh, destroying the ozone layer, recognizing the problem through the science and then taking worldwide action. That's a true success story and we can measure already now the recovery of the atmosphere. Now the problem scale for carbon dioxide, for fossil fuels and the whole energy sector is gigantic. It's many scales more difficult than the, di mm. than the problem with the right. uh, spray cans. Okay, so that said, uh, what worries you as a top scientist in this field, and you've been studying a, a long time, uh, physics and environmental physics, what worries you? The major thing that worries me is that science knew the basic facts already 25 years ago. Colleagues of mine, true pioneers, have been warning about global warming and global change mm -hmm. already 25 years ago. These were very valuable 25 years because if we had started to change the energy consumption sector already 25 years ago, we would be in a completely different situation in 
being able to meet the climate target mm -hmm. we have been talking about before. Mm -hmm. Today, after 25 years of accelerated consumptions and emissions of fossil fuels into the atmosphere, and additional warming and committed warming for the next few decades, these targets have become very, very ambitious. Yes, but do we have to see it at an individual level where the polar bears are no more extinct? Uh, the salmon stop running, uh, we can't grow crops, we're short of food. Do you think it will take that or are we getting a little smarter? I do hope that we are getting a little smarter because science provides us the information what will happen to ecosystems, what will happen to the Arctic mm -hmm. ice cover that is so important for the polar bears, what will happen to the tropical rainforest if precipitation bands are changing under global right. warming. We know these facts. We are communicating these facts. Now the policymakers need to listen and the societies need mm -hmm. to move. And we need a proper energy policy in every country, I would think. I think that is key. There is this so-called common but differentiated responsibility. So we need to step forward as the developing countries to show the way mm. how we want mm. to develop in the future. Mm -hmm. So tonight, climate change, what do we know? Uh, why do we know what we know? <laughs> and you told me some of that. What else will you expand on this evening? I'll basically make three points. First, we have observations that are based on physical measurements all around the globe. We know the globe is warming. We know the globe has warmed since 1900 by 0.8 degrees Celsius. We know that uh, sea level has risen by 17 centimeters. These are all facts. Mm. The second fact is that we understand the climate system. We understand the processes. Of course, there are still uncertainties. But these uncertainties are not elementary to the story that we tell. And that story is a story of change, a story of warming, a story of changing all uh, things in climate that depend on temperature. And the third point I will make is we have instruments at hand, climate models, which are variants mm -hmm. of weather prediction models, which allow us to look into the future which allow us to draw up scenarios. What happens if we follow a high emission path? How do the temperatures change in 50 years, in 100 years, if we follow a smaller emission scenarios? What are the benefits? What are the challenges? Mm -hmm. These three points I wish to make tonight. Okay, I bet you will, and there'll be a crowd there because it's not hockey night. I'm <laughs> grateful. Thank you nice very much. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, climate change, why do we know what we know? Free public lecture tonight at SFU Harbor Center, Dr. Thomas Stalker.